so uh, my name is Sagi Luce. I'm a senior security researcher for Aqua Security. Um, I did this research along with uh, Michael Cherney, who's the head of research uh, for Aqua Security. And let's just dive into uh, what's on the menu today and what we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about a lot about uh, containers and container development. Uh, and the main course of this lecture is going to be how we're going to attack developers. I'm going to break this down to three steps. We ha we'll have uh, a demo for each step. We'll introduce two uh, new kinds of attacks, uh, the host rebinding attack and the shadow container attack. And finally, we'll see like a whole flow and then we'll have uh, hopefully some conclusions. So containers, what are they? So this is the risky part uh, beside the microphone. I actually want to try to show something. Because uh, how many guys of you ever ran a container? Show my hands. Oh, lots of you. So maybe I don't know. But if you didn't run a container, uh, uh, I just want to give a feeling of what that is. Uh, so I'm going to drop the mic. Docker is a pretty popular, I think the most popular uh, container engine. And you can think of containers as sort of a virtual machine. So for example, here on my host, I have two, it's a Windows host, I have two sort of a virtual machine they call uh, images. Images basically, you can think of it as the operating system of a container, more or less. And so I have Nginx and Debian, and now I'm going to run a container. Have, have. So I'm running a Debian container and um, like I said, I'm on Windows and I'm doing LS and it looks like I'm inside a Linux machine. I can also look at the operating system and it shows that it's Debian. And I also can look at the kernel, which shows something called Mobile Linux. A little bit weird, we'll discuss uh, about it a little bit later. And I can also see uh, it's 64 bits. So how would that work? Uh, so if, I, if you ever been to a lecture about containers, you've probably seen this slide. It's trying to compare on the left side uh, virtual machine against containers. So if I'm a developer, uh, let me so uh, here I can write applications on top of containers. I don't need this whole heavy lifting uh, virtual machine does uh, to take care of the operating system itself and also the hypervisor uh, layer that is needed to run virtual machines. I can simply write a container which is actually a process and it's living inside its own virtual little world so it sees its own processes on network stack and its own file system. And containers basically work everywhere. Obviously you can write Linux containers and work over Linux, but they will also run just like you saw here on Windows and on Mac. And if you want you can even write Windows containers. So how big this thing is? Uh, I'm a little bit surprised to see so many people know about containers. Um, these are stats from Dr. On from uh, the beginning of the year. Again, Docker, the biggest, uh, currently the biggest uh, container agent. And these are from yesterday. Uh, they tweeted uh, from DockerCon, the Docker Women's team, how, how much did they grow in the past less than a year? So we see pretty big numbers uh, 40 million different hosts uh, connecting to the Docker Hub and pulling stuff, and now we're up to 21, and these numbers are very big. 1.2 million applications, over 21 billion uh, image pools. So there's a pretty big uh, uh, community of developers writing and running containers. And can, uh, developers are pretty uh, favorite target for attackers. Uh, developers are getting paid to write code. They don't get paid to do things securely. So uh, they have 
a lot of technical skill, usually very religious on their machines. And also, almost by definition, they have access to code, IP, in case of containers, uh, registries. So even if you infect uh, a single developer, and that developer is writing a microservice or an image, you can infect the entire pipeline from build to uh, testing all the way down to production. So this was sort of an intro, so let's dive into the attack. Uh, I'm going to give an attack overview. Uh, for this attack to work, we basically need two things. We need a developer working uh, with Docker, having his uh, TCP port open. Uh, this is not a lot to ask. This was also uh, the default uh, installation once you uh, download Docker for Windows. And we need to get the developer to visit some malicious web page. Uh, also, not very hard to do. And from there, we're going to dive into a Windows 10 attack. We're going uh, to break it down to three, like I said. Uh, like most attack, we're going to start with remote code execution, and we'll do that by using the Docker API. Then we're going to go ahead and do a host rebinding attack, uh, which is a new form of attack we uh, introduce here. This will give us privilege escalation over the Docker daemon, and finally we'll run a shadow container, which will give us persistency. So abusing Docker API. Uh, the idea of uh, abusing it came when we tried to figure out how this works. Uh, like you saw, I did Docker run and a container is running, but what is really happening? How a Linux container is running in a millisecond on a Windows machine? So we tried to understand how that works. And uh, the story is that there is no magic there, of course. Uh, what you are doing is you have your command line client, that command line client is talking over RESTful API with a Docker daemon that is on your host. And that Docker daemon on your host is talking through a virtual socket to a virtual machine uh, running inside your host, whether it's uh, Windows or Mac. And by default, in uh, older versions of Docker, uh, that port was open. So of course we thought, what will happen if we'll try to abuse it through a malicious web page? So it's not that uh, simple. Uh, I'm sure the uh, audience here knows what uh, the same origin policy is. So uh, browser security came to the right place, I think. Uh, it's the browser's job to ensure that your data doesn't uh, get leaked to another domain. So if, for example, you go to uh, your favorite news site, you can see all your friends that liked a certain page. But that doesn't mean that that new set can actually go to Facebook and read the list of all your friends and uh, send messages to them. And one of the security measures that does that is the same origin policy. So if a request is made across a region, if it's not from the same domain protocol or host, then it's not considered to be from the same region and it's bound through restrictions. So you can only uh, send simple uh, messages and also, you can do anything that you want with the HTTP method. You can send get, but you can get the response. You can send plus with the body, and so forth. So we said, OK, that's, our, that's the playing field. Uh, let's go ahead and list all the Docker API calls that don't violate the same new policy. And immediately, we notice the build API call. So what build does? Uh, build basically tells uh, the Docker engine to construct an image. And it uh, looks at something called the Docker file. It's basically a text file. And it's reading it line by line and does things. Uh, here, for example, I'm pulling from an image called Alpine. I'm adding some shellcode. I'm updating packages. And finally, I'm running some shellcode. So building is actually executing code because we have the run command. So we said, let's go ahead, let's use this build image API call. Uh, like I said, it doesn't violate the same region policy, and it has some very interesting parameters. First parameter is the tag parameter. So you can create an image, and you can call it whatever you want. Uh, the second very interesting parameter is the remote parameter. So you can build an image 
strong repository you find uh, on GitHub, for example. So you can use GitHub as a sort of a command and control infrastructure. And finally, you can control the network mode over which uh, this building process happens. So of course, you want to select something that has access to the network uh, of the host. So now we're going to see a demo to demonstrate uh, how from a single API call you can do something malicious. We'll simply build uh, an image and that image is going to open a reverse shell. Uh, so you can see we have here the actual command. Uh, it's the post build command. Uh, the remote tag points to some repository uh, that we already created over GitHub and we're going to use the network mode of the host. And this is the actual uh, file that we have in GitHub, single file called Docker file, and as you can see, all it does is open a reverse shell. So let's see how would that work. So the first uh, thing that will happen, uh, the victim, the developer, will visit a malicious web page, which will issue a single post request. That request uh, will be forwarded to the Docker daemon on the virtual machine. So now the Docker daemon goes ahead and pulls uh, our GitHub, which is our Kubernetes <coughs> control center. And then it's running uh, the build container, which opens up a reverse shell. So let's see how that works. Uh, here we have, uh, on the left hand, we have victim. And on the right, we have uh, the attacker. So first, I'm going to uh, list the images and the containers on the victim. So we have uh, just one image, and there are no containers. On the attacker side, uh, all I have to do is simply wait, uh, host my malicious web page that sends a single uh, post request. I'm doing uh, Python, and I'm waiting for incoming uh, connections. That will be the reverse shell. So one that, uh, once that is happening, uh, as the victim, all I have to do is navigate uh, to that malicious web page. Uh, I'm going to click on. And once I do so, you can see the entire build process uh, feedback. Uh, this is just for a demo. So you can hide it in the case of an actual attack. And once this is done, uh, the reveal show will be open. We can see the actual images that I pulled. I pulled the uh, Alpine image. And you can see the container that is running. And that container, of course, opened the reverse shell. And now I can go ahead. I'll look at the network interfaces from the reverse shell. I'm actually running on the container on the virtual machine. And here is the virtual interface. So of course, we noticed, uh, we informed Docker that they have this issue. Uh, so their fix was to make the TCP port option an opt-in feature. So you can still use it, but it is off by default. So that's the first step. So single command, uh, running code inside the host. And now we're going to go to the host rebinding attack. So of course, we asked ourselves, like, what is the next step of the attack? So we have a malicious web page. We have a running container. But we are limited with what we can do. We can't uh, do anything that we want in front of the uh, Docker daemon. Of course, our API is limited because of the same origin policy. And we have a limited lifetime of the Docker container. It won't run forever. Another form of attack I'm sure many of you are familiar with that we thought about is maybe to DNS rebinding. Uh, so, uh, spoiler alert, uh, we don't do DNS rebinding. Uh, it's not a new attack. It's pretty old, about 20 years ago. Uh, made famous by a guy called uh, Dan Kaminsky. Uh, and I'm not going to discuss too much about uh, DNS rebinding, uh, but just to give a feeling of how it works, uh, and then why we chose not to do it. Uh, so, for example, uh, if I'm an attacker and I want to attack an internal server used by the victim, uh, I can set up a domain called attacker.com, and I get the victim to uh, visit my attacker.com, so he issues a DNS request. And I answer with two different IPs. One is my actual IP, and the second one is the IP that I actually want to attack. So the browser goes ahead and pulls uh, 
my uh, web content, which is some malicious script, and all that script does is issue another HTTP request. And now I'm resetting the connection, so uh, I've effectively bypassed the same origin policy. Now the browser is using the second IP, which is the internal IP, but he's still thinking that he is over attacker.com. So all the same origin policy restrictions are no longer uh, working, so the attacker script can have full access to the internal server. So like I said, we're not doing the answer binding. Uh, it may fail, it's something that goes outside of the perimeter and can get caught. And uh, we don't want to go through the hassle of building up a domain, maintaining it, making sure it doesn't get blocked by IP reputation and so forth. Uh, so instead we're going to attack uh, another protocol uh, called uh, LLMNR, basically a name resolution protocol uh, using Windows environments and uh, it's DNS done over the local area uh, network and it's very easy to attack. So when a Windows machine is trying to look for a host that is not a domain, it's just a host name, it will use local uh, protocols such as LLMNR and to broadcast uh, a request over all interfaces including virtual interfaces, including the virtual interface of the virtual machine. So you can see where this is going. So now we can spoof LLMNR responses from a container sharing the same network as the uh, virtual host. And that response is cached in the browser. Uh, in most browsers, it's cached for about a minute. And if it's a minute, uh, so it means it will take us a minute to bypass the same origin policy. But if a minute is too much, you can skip this cache uh, in Firefox, for example. If you simply delay the HTTP response in half a second, so instead of waiting 60 seconds to bypass uh, the same origin policy, it will take you half a second. So how would that work? Uh, so the starting of this part of the attack, so we assume we already have a reminder container running inside the virtual machine. Uh, we got that in the first step. Uh, and what is going to happen now, we're going to redirect from the malicious web page to HTTP slash pod. And what will happen is that the host will query where is pod, it will query it over the virtual interface, and we can spoof from the reminder and lie that said that we are pod. So now the uh, web server is going to download some malicious script from the reminder. And what we're doing in this uh, script is simply continuously trying to uh, query a path that we know will have good result on uh, HTTP 200 response from the Docker daemon. So at the beginning we get 404 from our own uh, reminder container and we continue to do so every five seconds. And finally the caching expires a minute, so another request is issued, we spoof it again, this time with the IP of the local host, and now we know that we bypass the similar policy, we get a 200 response, and to demonstrate what we can do with it, we're going to steal some secrets from the Docker daemon and post those secrets back uh, to the reminder container. So let's see that happening. So here I'm going to uh, my local host from my own host, of course, so I'm listing my secrets and I only have uh, uh, one little secret called my secret. This is my most secretive secret. Now, when I run my uh, rebinder container, uh, of course, I'm using the network stack of the host and it is beginning to uh, spoof responses and hosting a malicious web page. So now I'm going to go over to that malicious web page. I'm going to pond uh, with the same uh, port number of the Docker daemon. We're going to open the debug part uh, to see the actual requests. So you can see once we loaded the malicious web page, what is happening is we have a request happening every few seconds. And uh, that request doesn't have any response from the web server. And this will continue, uh, like I said, for about a minute. So uh, we're going to speed it up a little bit, so we won't wait the full minute. <coughs> and here it goes, we're speeding it up, and after a minute, the caching will expire, another uh, request will be issued, another spoof will happen, and then we'll bypass the same origin policy, you can see it here. 
I'm reading the secrets and I'm posting them back to the reminder. So to recap, so far, uh, may have seen complicated, so I'll break it down. Uh, we've seen two steps of the attack. Uh, first, we've used the Docker API. Uh, in the demo, I just opened a reverse shell, but you can do that to start a reminder container, like we saw in the second demo. And the reminder container's job is to bypass uh, the same origin policy. So now I have a reminder container running, and I have full access to the Docker daemon. And the question is, what to do next? And let me suggest uh, an attack called a shadow container. So what is a shadow container, and why should we do it? Um, so, so far, we have the uh, ability to run any privileged container that we want uh, on the virtual host, which means we have full access to the virtual host, uh, full access to uh, Mobile Linux, full access to this file system, and we have access to the internal uh, enterprise network. But we are still not concealed. For example, anybody who does Docker RPS, we chose all the containers, will see our container, and we don't want that. And we're not persistent, because if you turn off the Docker daemon, or if you turn off the machine, which turns off the Docker daemon, uh, what happens is when the Docker uh, machine boots up again, it loads from an image. So whatever is left on the machine uh, will be deleted. Everything except, of course, the state of Docker. So how do we make this also persistent and concealed? So let's assume for one minute that I already have two scripts on virtual machine. So one, in, one of them is the attack script, uh, I'll call it my script, and the other one is a shutdown script. So what happens when the Docker daemon shuts down, it's going to run a shutdown script, which will create a container, let's call it a shutdown container. And that shutdown container whole job is to keep the state of the attack. So the script, my attack script, will be saved inside the shadow container. And once the Docker daemon is up again, my shadow container will write back the scripts to the virtual machine. So I'm back to where I started. So now I have this sort of uh, ping pong game. So whenever the user is actually running Docker and using Docker, all of my attack is being done and saved on the virtual machine. And whenever the daemon is reset, uh, a shadow container is created, which the user doesn't have access to because the Docker daemon is shutting down. And uh, he can't see the, uh, the attack. And when it's back up again, I'm back in the game. Uh, this is the actual uh, shadow script that I'm going to use in this demo. Uh, it's a pretty simple script. All it is doing is loading uh, into a variable my attack script. And then this variable is given to uh, the container as an environment variable. Uh, I'm running a privileged container. Uh, I will name it shadow, and you will also know there's a restart policy. And the restart policy tells the Docker daemon to continuously try and execute the container until it succeeds. And when it succeeds, it kills itself. And this is the uh, actual attack script. Also not too complicated. Uh, its job is to check if the machine is still in the process of shutting down and it's not going to do uh, anything. It goes back to sleep. But if it's starting up, then it's going to write down the scripts back to the hard disk, uh, install the shutdown script, and finally we can do something bad. Uh, in my case, I could only think about uh, doing one bad thing, writing a file. So my bad thing to show that this is actually uh, doing the bad stuff is uh, write a file into, writing hacked into the shadow file. But of course you can scan the network, uh, break into machines, brute force stuff, or do whatever you want. Uh, okay. So now let's see a demo of uh, the final part of the attack. So we will run the shadow container directly from command line. So to show that I have nothing up my sleeves, I'm going to uh, list the images and the containers on my host. So I have two images and two containers. And I'm going to run an inspecting container, and that container will give me access to the underlying virtual machine. And I see I have no shadow file there. 
no big surprise. So I did this simple command, which runs uh, the shadow container. And once I do it, uh, when I list the images and containers, we see that nothing has changed. I still have two images and two containers. But of course, uh, when I look inside the virtual machine, there is the shadow file. So I left nothing behind, and I've done my evil stuff, which is write the shadow file. Uh, we can even see uh, the attack script here that we saw in the presentation uh, and the uh, shadow script. But to prove that this is actually working, we'll have to restart the Docker daemon to see that it's actually uh, that we remain persistent. So we're going to restart the daemon, and then we're going to repeat the whole thing. We're going to look at the images, uh, look at the containers, look inside the virtual machine to see that the attack is still uh, happening. Bear with me for a few more seconds. There it is. The daemon is up. So now I'm, uh, I'm going to use the specter again. I'm going to look at the images and containers. So we're back where we started. We still have two images. We still have two containers. And uh, when we look at the virtual machine, we still have the shadow file, even though the machine was booted up from, uh, from an image. So we proved that we remain persistent using the shadow container. So we've broken down the attack uh, into three parts, uh, but let's see how it works from beginning until the end. So to recap, uh, first step, we're going to visit a malicious web page, which will abuse the Docker API. This will give us a running rebinder container. And the second step, the rebinder container will perform the was rebinding attack, so now we will have uh, full privileges over the Docker daemon. We'll use these privileges to run a privilege payload. That payload's job is to write down the shutdown script. And when it does so, we can delete all of those uh, images from the from Docker uh, daemon. We don't want to leave anything behind. And whenever the Docker restarts, it will shadow container, whenever it's back up again, you put a shadow script, and you get the idea. So let's uh, look at a full demo. So it's very similar to what we did in the beginning. Uh, we're going to look at the uh, initial state. We have two images and two containers. So when we look inside uh, the virtual machine, at the beginning, of course, we won't see uh, anything, uh, no shadow file. Great, so we're ready to start. So I'm going to go to uh, shadowcontainer.com, love the website. I'm going to click a button, uh, and again, we're going to see the feedback from uh, the creation of the container. Uh, something that you can hide, of course, this is just for the demo. Uh, below this part, which is running the rebinder of the container, there's another frame that is waiting for uh, the rebinder container to actually finish. And when the rebinder container finishes, we're going to start spoofing responses, so I'll be able to load the bottom frame. So it's loaded, and now I'm actually inside uh, the host rebinding uh, attack phase. So this will take, like I said, about a minute. And as long as the attack is going on, you can actually go back to the, uh, to the Docker daemon and see it going on. So if I do Docker PS, I can see the actual binder container running and the images that it, it pulled. <coughs> and now, of course, uh, I'll wait for the timer to expire. We can see the 200 response, so we know the timer has expired. Uh, and what we have to do now is run the privilege payload. So we create a privilege payload. Uh, we're going to, of course, uh, start the privilege payload. And finally, we're going to delete whatever images uh, we downloaded to begin with. So once I'm done, uh, let's look again at, uh, at the images of containers. So after the attack is done, we're back to where we started. We have two images and two containers on the host. 
And of course, it won't be any surprise that once we look inside the virtual machine, we'll find the shadow file. Good, so just again to make sure uh, I'm not fooling you, even though this is video, uh, I'm going to restart the Docker demon and repeat the whole thing. Right, so the Docker demon is up. We're going to do the same shtick. So we still have the shadow file, of course. Uh, we can still see our uh, tag script and the shadow script uh, inside the virtual machine. And of course, once I uh, look at the images and containers, I want you to surprise, you're back where we started. Two images and two containers. So what's the impact? What did we see? Uh, so we actually see a form of an advanced persistent threat against developers. Uh, we use uh, shadow containers for persistency. All of the bad stuff that we are doing uh, is concealed inside the virtual machine. Uh, it has a very low forensic footprint because uh, the part of the attack that gets logged on the host is just the initial part. When you run the binder container, that will be logged on the host. All of the other stuff that you're doing are logged inside the virtual machine. And you can delete them because you have full access to the virtual machine. And of course we have access to uh, internal network of the enterprise. So from that point we can do reconnaissance, take over machines, and so forth. Uh, another danger of such a text, like I touched on at the beginning, is the shadow war. If it's a developer and it's writing images uh, that are used finally in production, you can infect the layer, uh, you can put some other malicious code there, and if you do it good enough, it will propagate throughout the pipeline and you won't be discovered. <coughs> and another thing you'll have to note is that this uh, attack, even with, as we've seen it over then you can do it in different variations uh, over Mac, Linux, and Windows. Uh, in Mac and Linux, of course, you won't be able to do the host rebinding attack, uh, so you'll have to do DNS rebinding. But then, if you're over Mac, you can still run a shadow container. Uh, if you're over Linux, you don't need a shadow container because you have full access to the host. And in Windows, it's very similar to Linux. If you attack a Windows container, uh, and you run a privileged container, you have full access to the underlying host. So what are the conclusions? Uh, don't expose your uh, engine, container engine API. If you do have to expose it, make sure you authenticate to it, uh, so not anyone can go ahead and run any command that he wants uh, over the wire. Uh, don't forget to analyze your container engine logs. They may tell you when you're being attacked. And if you're not using uh, NetOS or LMNR or MDNS, just disable them over your host. Uh, make sure they don't appear uh, in your network. And finally, you never know how you're going to be attacked. So always uh, scan your registry, scan your images, and always monitor your containers in runtime. So that was me. Uh, thank you guys very much. Uh, if you have any questions. Uh, we can do this online right now, or you can ping me uh, through my handle, and we'll talk. Thank you.